to today's talk on deserialization, the last talk before the lunch. I hope, I hope uh, it's interesting and you don't leave early to get the food. Uh, the mandatory slide about myself. I'm a software developer in the past, spent over a decade writing code for uh, one small company listed here. And then I kind of moved to the uh, security side of the business because um, to me, it started to, to look like a little bit more interesting, um, not writing code, but breaking code and uh, uh, having a bigger impact. So I kind of moved to security 100% by now. Uh, I'm currently working for Salesforce. And uh, in the future, I, I have no idea. Probably security. So um, today's talk about deserialization. As you might know, back in 2017, this uh, thing was added to OWASP top 10 and became a hot topic all, all of a sudden. It, but it was not new at that time. So uh, when this happened, the company I used to work for asked me to prepare a, cl a class for our clients on this particular topic, on deserialization, because that's was part of the thing that my company did. And I thought, okay, well, it's kind of, I'm, I'm honored, well, whatever. But uh, it, it's, it's a boring topic, that's what I thought. And then I started looking into all the information online about this, all the different things that you could do through insecure digitalization, all the different frameworks and, uh, and tools. And I realized that this is actually a pretty cool topic, and it's large. It, you cannot compress it enough. And in today's talk, I'm not planning to do that either. So um, we'll talk about what deserialization is, talk briefly about different formats and languages. I'll give you a bunch of demos of, of different things you could do through insecure deserialization. We're not going to go into all the details, but all my code that I'm using today is on GitHub, and you'll get a chance if you want to download it and play with it and explore it a little bit more. We'll talk about several prominent vulnerabilities and, of course, uh, ways to avoid issues. So some people think that digitalization is some kind of esoteric uh, subject that uh, very complex, but uh, this picture represents what it is. So imagine you have a program with some kind of an object in its memory, and then that program wants to send that object to a different program, or maybe store it on the disk for later retrieval. And the way it's normally done, that internal object, whatever that is, is converted to a byte stream that can be sent over any possible media. It could be a, a network, it could be a REST API call, it could be some parameter, or it could be just a, a file on the disk. And on the other side, the other program receives that byte stream and converts it back to an internal representation of an object. So the former is called serialization and the latter is called deserialization. It's a very, very simple concept. And nothing can go wrong with it, right? Uh, in terms of formats, uh, we can say that we have some binary formats, and those are usually related to languages that support serialization natively, like Java, Python, and .NET, but not always. Um, and we also have human-readable formats, like XML. If you th think about it, XML, if you look at it, well, first of all, it's text, you can read it, and uh, you can understand it that it's some kind of a structure, right? You can say it's an object, so you can reconstruct it to maybe something else. There are some data, there are some uh, attributes, some values, okay? Any XML-based formats, like, like SOAP, for example, is also serialized data. JSON is a good example, too, um, and others. Like, for example, PHP is using text-based uh, format. Um, Google protocol buffers is another example. Of course, this is just a subset. You can go to Wikipedia or somewhere else to get a whole huge list. And with that, we're going to move into our first demo and take a look at how 
couple of these uh, languages implement serialization. Uh, if I can find my, and that's not a one. Okay. So I have a program called Basic Serialize. What it does is it creates um, an object of a certain class here. The class is called just a class. And it's a very simple class. It has a couple of fields, ID and name. And that's it. And then what it does is uh, it opens a file output stream to store object into a file. And then what's really important here is the object output stream. Uh, and that's the actual class that takes care of serialization. And we call that method called write object. And that's where actual serialization happens. So the object gets stored to file, and then we open the file here, and we call the method called read object of object input stream. And that's where deserialization happens. So uh, I mean, there's a lot of lines of code here that are maybe not important to look at right now, but these two, write object and read object, is where the magic happens. If we look at, so the, the, uh, the object was written to file object.ser. If you take a look at this file, um, it's some kind of a binary format. Here on the right, you can see that there are some unreadable characters, but there are also some text data, like the string, the answer, right? So, and even, uh, even the name of the class, just a class is here in plain text. So even though it's binary format, there are some text data there. And perhaps you can manipulate it. OK, let's take a look at Python. Uh, uh, here I have two programs. One is saving an object to a file, and another one is reading the object from the file. And output is the same. So the, the object was written to a file object.ser. Again, um, again, if you look at it, it's, it's not Java, it's different, but it's also some kind of binary format. And very similar, we have you know, uh, some plain text data here. So it's not, it's not like hides anything from you, really. Um, you can actually unpack that yourself. So uh, right there, you, know, you might think that serialized data is some kind of hidden, encrypted, whatever, encoded, but not much. All right, uh, with that, we're going to move to our second demo, everybody's favorite session cookie. So this application has two parts, insecure and secure. Let me open the browser develop developer tools and go to insecure part, and we got a user cookie here from the application. And it looks to me like a base64 encoded value, which I'm going to copy and paste and try to decode it. Uh, I need to replace these with actual characters. Decoding this value gives us a JSON, basically, with just two key value pairs for, for username and for user role. And both are guessed. So what if I go ahead and replace guest? with admin. So I have a new JSON, right, with the role <coughs> equals admin. And if I base64 encode it now, I have a new value, copy and paste in my uh, browser, and I refresh the page, all of a sudden I'm the administrator, right? And it's a very, very silly example. And I wish I could say that it never happens in real life. But I can, could not say that, um, having a couple of years of uh, consulting work. Um, the problem here, of course, is the application does not validate my input in terms of, is it authentic? Is it what the application gave me in the first place? So it just gave me that cookie, which is basically some text data encoded in, in Base64. Uh, but there is no, uh, there is nothing that proves that it has not been tampered with, right? 
Okay, let's take a look at the secure portion of this application. And in secure path, we get another uh, user cookie. A, it, it looks similar here in, in, the, um, in the first part of it, but then it's, first of all, it's much longer. And it actually consists of two parts separated by a dot here. So the first part is the value itself. And the second part is a signature. In this case, it's HMAC, which is a cryptographic thing. So if I try to replace the first part with my forced value and refresh this page, I get kicked out. It's unauthorized. So how is that done? And where is my application? Here. This application is written in Node.js. And uh, the, that secure part is using this method called get user secure. And it has a cryptographic key. Uh, well, it's, it's a key which will be converted to a, to a cryptographic key to actually encrypt something. And it's using HMAC, like I mentioned. Um, HMAC authenticates the data based on a key. So this key is only known to this application. So when it gives that cookie to me, it's so um, you can say it signs it, and when it receives back, it validates that signature. And if the signature does not match, I get user equals null. I get I'm unauthorized. So that this is one of the things that applies to anything pretty much you do with serialized data. You always need to make sure that it's authentic that its integrity is preserved, that nobody tampered with it, unless you really need to accept some untrusted data. And there are some, some use cases for that too. But I would say most of the times, um, you, you, uh, you have some, some trusted parties that need to talk to each other, and they need to agree on something so they can authenticate mutually. All right, um, moving on to the next demo. Lots of demos. So this next application is a Java application. And let's say I'm, I want to uh, sell something on Amazon. Uh, and I contract a factory somewhere in China, maybe. And, they, and I order a million counterfeit iPhones from them. And they make it. They make, um, they make whatever I order. So they, they, they produce the product, and they send me the package, which in this case is a, is a file that I store on, the, on my local drive. Now I have that package with all these products. And then I go to the store, maybe Amazon, maybe some other store. But this one sells everything. So I give that package to them, and they sell it. And I get a message, they, they just sold 1 million iPhones. And I get the profit, right? So as you could have guessed, the, uh, that package is serialized data. And that factory is creating an object of the type items. And items is a very simple object. It has a name and quantity, exactly what I ordered. And then it serializes it and gives it here is this uh, write object method again. It serializes and sends back to me. I store it, and the store deserializes it. And this is super safe, as, as the comment says. But, in, but suppose the factory is malicious, and I happen to sign a contract with, with the factory that instead of uh, the product sends me some other things, and I'm going to store all of them on my local drive. So they give me some kind of a string, some kind of nested object. I don't even know what it is. But they, they'll disguise it, of course. They'll say, they'll say this is your actual product. Um, and uh, when I send it to the store, and they try to sell it, they get a Java exception, which is reasonable, right? Because it's not what they expected. It's not the, the, the items object, it's something else. And uh, 
let's let's take a look at what happened. So it says uh, the uh, the exception happened on line 27, which is this line, right? That's where actual deserialization happens. Well, nothing nothing bad. Well, we should have probably handled the exception and uh, failed gracefully. We didn't, but it's okay. We'll improve it. But if you pay close attention to the actual message here, it says the Java length string cannot be cast to class items, which suggests that deserialization did happen, the read object did return, and where we fail is we fail here on casting one type to another because they're not compatible and it cannot be done. So to prove my point that deserialization actually did happen, I'm going to send it another object, which is uh, the 64 gigabyte whatever. And now I, instead of exception, I get connection reset. So here it suggests that application crashed, or at least one well, that thread that handled the request crashed and uh, did not return. All right. So let me send it another thing which is the CPU bomb. And I click on the cell button and I wait. And it's spinning here, waiting. But I can tell you it's never going to return. So there is a, a something that, that my application could not handle at all. So first of all, let's take a look at these objects on the disk. The, the string object is like pretty small. The Linux file command identifies all of them as serialized Java data, of course. The, uh, the biggest one of them is the five kilobyte CPU bomb. So at this point, I have no other option than to go to my uh, virtual machine that runs this application and see what's going on. So when I run the top command, you can see that the very first line here is a Java process that's using 100% of the CPU. And like I said, I mean, we can wait here all day. It's never going to return. It's just going to spin the cycles. And what is this process? Let's take a look. It's our Tomcat. And it's, it's like now it's in this infinite loop that's consuming all my CPU resources. And I don't have any other option than to kill it. So I try to go like to admin um, interface, kill this thread maybe. But in this case, it's not, poss not possible. You got to kill the whole thing. Oops. So what, what, what just happened here? In uh, one of these examples, this is that 64 gigabyte object, which is a very small object on the disk, as we saw, just um, maybe 100 bytes. But this, this one, when deserialized, it tries to allocate 64 gigabytes of RAM. And I don't have this much memory on this laptop, right? Uh, maybe some people do, but um, it's not the point. The point is that during deserialization, uh, you, can, you can make certain things to happen that are not very desirable. And this little object uh, consumes my CPU cycles indefinitely. Well, it's not little. It's, a, it's a, some kind of a tree structure, 100 levels deep. But, uh, oops. but at the end of the day, it's finite. It's only five kilobytes on the disk, but it's consuming my CPU indefinitely. So what can we do to avoid this kind of issues in Java? In Java, we can use, let me see if my application is up again. Yep. In Java, we can use, um, class whitelisting, also known as look-ahead deserialization. 
So we have a secure implementation of our store, and when we try to send one of these objects to it, we get a nice exception that they do not accept whatever we gave them. They do not accept hash set. Cool. Let's take a look. So this application is, instead of using the standard object input stream, is using safe object input stream, which is a subclass that we wrote here. And it overrides just one method called resolve class. This method is called right before deserialization. And here we, we have access to the class name. And that's what we check here. We get the name of the class that we get on the input, and we compare it to the name of the class that we expect. And if they don't match, that's, that's not good. And we just uh, throw an exception, and we're done with this. Sorry, we cannot sell this. So this is a, if you go to um, a OWASP page on deserialization, this is the method that is recommended there for Java. Please use it, along with authenticating data. But in this case, like this application, you, you could not authenticate the data because uh, you know, the factory and the store are completely independent entities. And there's probably no, no, no way to agree on a, uh, some kind of a signature in this case. All right, uh, enough with Java. Let's move to Python. And while denial of service is a very good thing that hacker can do uh, for their reasons, um, but every hacker wants to get ultimately a remote code execution on the server, right? So let's see how it can be done with Python. I have this little application written in Python, as you could have guessed. And it, this application gives me a session cookie. Again, what, what is this cookie? It's obviously a base64 encoded value. Let's take a look at it. I'm going to base64 decode it and save it to a file. And then I'm going to use my sample program that I showed in the beginning of the presentation to read that file. So that, this cookie is a very simple object with a couple of key value pairs for username and, and access. And again, like we already discussed, you, you can uh, do privilege escalation, for example, here, right? Um, we can override the access to admin and, and uh, be, become an administrator. But it's not, what, it's not our goal right now. So today, we want to get remote code execution. It, uh, yeah, and this is, the, this is the actual application. I used Flask for this. Gets the cookie, deserializes it, like you only live once. Um, and uh, yeah, and makes uh, authorization decisions ba based on that. It's not implemented yet. OK. So it happens that uh, in Python, there is a magic method called underscore underscore reduce underscore underscore. And this method will be executed during deserialization. And there is, I don't believe there is anything that you can do to prevent it. So if you accept a serialized Python data and deserialize it, and that, uh, that data is an object that has this, this method, um, you're basically done. So in this proof of concept, this method is calling a netcat to open a reverse shell. And let's see if it works. So first, I'm going to generate this payload. So this is our new base64 uh, encoded value for our session cookie, which is now it's not a session cookie anymore. It's our own object. And before I, so I. Um, put the cookie in the browser. Before I refresh the page to send the cookie to the application, let me start an netcat listener. And refresh. And it should work. Yeah, and we got a connection from somewhere. So where, what, what is this? Is this a shell? Yeah. Uh, where are we? Uh, whatever. Who are we? We root. So this application is not following best practices on not running as root. 
but I take it, right, as a hacker. And of course, I can do anything I want with the shadow file, or you know, I can destroy the entire thing. And, and um, I gave a Python example here. You can do the same thing with Java. It's a little more complex. You can maybe need to run a, another tool, but um, it's possible. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some uh, vulnerabilities that, were, that became known to us in the last few years. The, uh, probably the most famous one was related to Apache Commons collection gadget chains. And actually, that presentation was delivered here at AppSec Kali five years ago by Chris Frohoff. And um, it's awesome to speak here on that. Uh, so imagine you have a web application that, that, uh, that is uh, accepting some data from the user. And uh, that data is serialized Java data. And your application deserializes it. Um, if you have some libraries on the path, like any Java application has some libraries, and one of those libraries happens to be Apache Commons collections library, you can build so-called gadget chain, pack it into that serialized object, and send it to the application, and when deserialized, you get, you get remote code execute, uh, executed. And I, I, I am not going into all detail, details because it's a sub, uh, subject for a whole different talk and you can watch those talks online, there are several of them. But here is a sample of what happens during that gadget chain deserialization. The, um, the, the methods in bold are the ones from the Apache Commons collections library. And uh, nothing is horribly wrong here, but towards the, the bottom, you see things like get runtime, and then you see runtime.exec. And what, are, what is this? Well, this is executing um, a program on the machine with user supplied input. So where is the problem here, you might ask? Is this the, the library that's vulnerable? Well, many people think so, and they, think, OK, well, that library is vulnerable. I got to upgrade it. So Apache project uh, issues a new version of the library. I'm going to upgrade it and be done with it. They might fix that particular issue, but your application is still vulnerable because it's ser deserializing data insecurely. So if any one of these other libraries, X, Y, Z, or whatever, has a similar gadget chain or a method or an object that can be deserialized to get RCE, denial of service or whatever else, your application is still vulnerable. You got to stop things here. In our previous example, uh, we, we saw how it can be done in Java by whitelisting uh, classes and using the look ahead deserialization. OK, another example is Apache Struts REST plugin. In this case, it's not a native Java serialization. I believe it's extreme, but uh, it's also a method to serialize Java objects into XML. So here's an XML file, and this is an actual payload that I got from uh, not sure where. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you can see that we have some Java artifacts here, and you can guess what this long command that's suspiciously looking like reverse shell is, in fact, reverse shell. So this will execute a command on the server. Here's another vulnerability in Oracle WebLogic. Another remote code execution, also Java. In, but in this case, um, they use some kind of SOAP uh, format to serialize their data. And here, the attacker chose to remove all the files. Uh, I think I got this one straight out of uh, Metasploit. Yeah, and, and as I was looking in Metasploit for uh, WebLogic deserialization, I noticed that they had an issue every year since 2015. 
we have 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And uh, by this logic, another one is coming up this year, right? Um, but hopefully not. Hopefully they fixed it. But this is just shows you how difficult it is to take care of all these things when, you, when your application needs to deserialize data. And you, you got to be extremely careful with that. And they, many people struggle with this, and uh, rightfully so. Okay. No more Java. Let's talk about .NET. CyberArk, if you don't know what it is, uh, CyberArk pass 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 Password Vault is, uh, so, if you will, enterprise level password manager. You store all your big secrets there for privileged access, for privileged accounts. Um, very cool thing. And they have a REST API, which sometimes is very handy. And of course, the API is authenticated. And you got to use a token to authenticate that's given to you. That token happens to be a serialized .NET object. Um, and there was nothing wrong with that, as long as it's done correctly, but they had an issue. First, there was no integrity or authenticity protection. Um, so anybody could tamper with that token and submit something else. Uh, but the worst part was there was, there was no class type validation, and one could, could build completely different object of different class and give it to the application and cause the .NET uh, gadget chain like the ones in the Commons collection? Of course. I don't know what the lights are. It, it caused the remote code execution. So uh, somebody found it and they contacted the vendor. They fixed it. Do I control the lights from here? I think so, yeah. Uh oh, over there. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, somebody uh, found this and uh, contacted the vendor. They fixed it. And then they published, the researchers found, uh, who found this published the exploit. And this is the exploit. The first line here is payload generator using the tool YSO serial for .NET. And the second command is a curl command to deliver the payload to the application. And the second part you could do with anything else, like Postman or whatever. And like when you look at this, do you think this is something that's very difficult to do? No, right? I mean, any script kitty can do this. In fact, we're going to do it right now. So let me switch to another virtual machine. And here on this machine, unfortunately, I do not have CyberArk license. But I have a different application called CyberPark. <laughs> and all similarities are completely accidental. This application has one REST API endpoint. When I click on it, it gives me some sample value. So if I try to do it in command line, I'm a huge command line fan, if, if you, as you can see. Um, it gives me this value here as a sample authorization value. So I got to submit authorization header with this value. Um, if I do that, it, gives me, it, it deserializes it and gives me back uh, the actual content of that object. OK, it's just a sample, foobar. But my goal is remote code execution today. And I'm going to use exactly what the, um, what the researchers used, uh, this YSO serial tool, to generate uh, an exploit to run a calculator. Every hacker wants to run a calculator on the server. So um, I generated that exploit. Now let me go back to that window. And I'm going to base64 encode that payload and submit it as authorization header to that application. And boom, we got our calculator. Um, of course, we got a huge exception message here, um, which says, unable to cast object of type blah, 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 to blah, blah, blah. But it's too late, right? It doesn't matter that the application failed. We have our code executed.
So if you're an attacker, or you build in a proof of concept for your client, uh, what can you use in terms of tools and approaches? So first of all, you might want to reverse engineer things. You might want to understand how the application works, what kind of data it sends, and how it wraps them, how it serializes it, what formats are. And there's, uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, there are no tools that will do everything automatically. A lot of times you, you have to do your own thing, and it's helpful when you can write code in some scripting language, for example. Or you can understand the, like, you can look at binary protocol and understand it, like some super, superhuman. Uh, but there are some tools, like Why So Serial for Java, uh, which was originally written by Chris Frohoff, who presented here five years ago. Um, and the YCSerial.net tool, which I just used two minutes ago, uh, payload generator for .NET. There are some burp extensions that help you analyze the traffic if you're dealing with the web applications and uh, show you the actual data content when it sees serialized data. You can take a look at, in, at the B App Store. And uh, like I said, I mean, Lots of times you have to write your own code. Sorry, guys, but yeah. But it's cool. Um, sometimes it's not very obvious. Sometimes you need to like, disguise your payload as some other object, which is included in another object. So you might have, a, have to have a multi-level system, and the application might check the top-level object against whitelist, but anything underneath is not being checked. And I've seen cases of that, and it's, it's really cool. And the developers are like, wow. Um, so takeaways, deserialization can be dangerous. It's a good thing to have, but I recommend not to use it, and just don't use it. And, but uh, yeah, of course, we have to use it, and there are legitimate uses and nice use cases for that. So you got to validate all the input against tampering, um, where it comes from. Is it within the same trust zone or not? Is it signed in any way? Is it coming from an untrusted user? Because sometimes you can probably trust the data if you know that you just talk into the server, which is right next to you, and they use some kind of mutual SSL authentication. So. Yeah, and you're part of one big system. Maybe in those cases, it's OK to just accept it. But in most cases, it's not. So right, authenticate all the data. Well, not all the data, but uh, you know what I mean, right? Uh, when you send something to the user and expect the user to send it back to you later, you, you got to assign that data somehow so they cannot tamper with it. As we saw, the uh, bad deserialization can cause all kinds of issues. Broken authorization, privilege escalation, denial of service, and even remote code execution. And last but not least, third-party components are vulnerable. And you, you just need to know what, you, what kind of components you use and how you use them, and then monitor their advisories and upgrade. So like I said, all the code that I use today is on GitHub. Feel free to to get it, play with it. You don't need much. You need a Vagrant. If you know what it is, it's a thing that helps you build a virtual machine out of a script. And, and that's pretty much it. And uh, with that, are there any questions? Yes? How good are the static analysis? Microphone. Hello. The question is, how good are, are the static analysis tools? to catch these kind of issues. Like, like any static analysis tool, there are false positives and there are false negatives. Um, it really depends on the tool. I don't know. Um, you, you gotta, I have not specifically tested any tool for this. So I guess I don't have an answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> do, do you have a question? Yeah, here. Hello. Just wondering if you had a recommendation for a library like the Java example you showed where you subclass it, there's probably 
some good libraries out there, I would think, that you could use for standard, like, object communication where they're, they're signed, signed in or, um, or uh, authenticating okay, okay, okay. object serialization just for any application, maybe. Uh, if you go to the OWASP section on deserialization, they, uh, they give you a link to a lib Java library that is doing class whitelisting and look ahead deserialization for you. So I recommend using that so you don't have to write your own. But I am not sure about the second part, which is um, authenticating the data. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. We yeah. use JOTS for it, but that might get big. Yeah, and JOTS are not necessarily useful for like serializing plain Java objects. Right. Um, yeah. Like I know in one of the Oh, one of the uh, development teams that I'm working with, they, they implemented their own HMAC. Um, they just use standard Java libraries to, so they, uh, they, they get that base64 encoded value and then they HMAC it and send HMAC along. So it, and it's not difficult to do, the standard tools. A lot of crypto. Is there any question? Uh, go ahead, I'll repeat the question. Java exception on a REST API? Yeah, any suggestions if you don't have access to the code, you're doing black box testing and you see an exception? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of, of course. Uh, sometimes it's very obvious that serialized data is being used because in, case of, in cases of like Java and .NET, there is a, at least those, um, probably others too, there is a, a specific signature. So serialized Java data always begins with certain eight bytes. Yeah, like one of those slides we had at, if I can find it quickly. Um, and uh, .NET is the same. There is a certain, yeah, here on the right. If you base64 encode it, it's RO0AB. So if you see that, you know that serialized data is used. And you can then try maybe one of those payload generators and replace legitimate data with your payload and see what happens. Maybe you're lucky and you get RC right away, but maybe not. And then you have to do some reverse engineering. No Java object fuzzers out there? No uh, Java object fuzzers, uh, maybe. <laughs> Is there any, any other questions? Okay, thank you for the presentation. Yeah.